Good evening, everyone. My name is Kate Clark. I am the Director of Immigration Services at Jewish Family Service of San Diego, one of the founding members of the San Diego Rapid Response Network. Um, and now we are operating a migrant shelter. So it is a distinct honor to be able to share with you our work that we have done in the community over the last several years, but acknowledging that many people in this room are a part of that effort and continue to be, and I will share with you, um, ways to be involved in, in the future should you be interested um, to volunteer with us. So. Um, I'm going to start off by talking about the Rapid Response Network and how it was founded and then I'll move into the, the shelter and then I'll speak a little bit about the family that was highlighted in the film that um, Kayla shared and really that was a family that was impacted by the migrant protection um, protocol that was recently enacted or a policy that came down from this administration. Um, and we were in a position to basically assist that family um, with legal representation in addition to serving them at our shelter. So um, I think it was a, a really poignant um, way of showing the people that are coming on the south side of the border and how they're entering this country and what's happening um, once they are here, should they be um, lucky enough to um, get through the gauntlet. Um, so the Rapid Response Network really came about in, um, after the change of administration. A lot of immigrant advocates came together, organizations that are committed to advancing immigrant rights, and we knew that we couldn't really do the same thing that we were previously doing, um, that we had to change our ways and disrupt um, really the, the status quo. Um, so we spent about 10 months in uh, the early 2017 kind of studying different models. Um, the San Francisco Rapid Response Network, which you saw in one of the films, was one of the ones that we extensively studied to see how we could come together as legal services organizations, as immigrant rights organizations, as community, community organizers and, and faith groups um, to support, to make sure that no one in our community could, um, you know, be alone essentially. So. Um, truth be told that when we were doing these studies that we thought that really we would be responding to immigration enforcement that was happening on the north side of the border. Um, perhaps that was ignorant, but we really just thought that we were going to be supporting the mis mixed status families that were in our community that were um, subject to ICE raids and other immigration enforce enforcement that was taking place in our community. Um, we launched in December of 2017, and shortly after our launch, we quickly realized that um, it was going to be much more than interior enforcement that we were going to be responding to. Um, shortly after, family separation crisis uh, erupted, and um, obviously the caravans, and then now um, many, you know, several different policies that have come down um, impacting um, many of the asylum seekers that are presenting at the border, and also obviously the populations that are um, in the United States with us that are our family members, they are our friends, they're our colleagues, they're our students um, that we are um, so desperately trying to protect. Um, so what the Rapid Response Network is in short is a 24-hour hotline that is operated by volunteer dispatchers and responders. Um, we have the language capacity right now to support uh, Spanish and English, but we're looking to add other languages uh, as we have volunteers that are able to operate the line. So in the event of an emergency, any affected person or family or community bystander could call the 24-hour hotline to report an immigration emergency, as you saw in the film with San Francisco. Um, in addition to this 24-hour hotline, we at Jewish Family Service off operate a non-emergency hotline, and this is a legal services hotline and has been just as active as our immigration emergency hotline. Um, but what we do through that non-emergency line is offer anyone that can call, uh, that wants to call the non-emergency line with a free legal consultation. Um, and what we do after this free legal consultation is we identify a viable immigration benefit for the individual or family, then we will work with our other legal service partners. So um, those are the organizations that are re receiving California Department of Social Services funding. So Casa Cornelia Law Center, Catholic Charities of San Diego, um, the ABA Immigration Justice Project, Legal Aid Society of San Diego, and JFS. So we work with those organizations on a daily basis to make sure that we can holistically serve 
all of the people that are coming through that non-emergency hotline and of course in addition to the emergency hotline. What this is doing is really changing the service delivery model so that we can really respond to the needs of these families that are in crisis. So rather, what was happening before the Rapid Response Network basically was somebody would call Casa Cornelia or they would call Catholic Charities or all of the other organizations and they'd say, I'm in desperate need of getting an attorney to you know, review my case. I am scared. My uncle was just picked up. I'm concerned it's gonna happen to me. How can I see you? When can I see you? And a lot of times the answer to that question was, I'm sorry, you have to fill out this intake. You're gonna to have to wait three months. And at best, that person would come back in three months. But we know a lot of times that person would feel scared and they'd, of course, want to seek services in advance. And so a lot of times they were turning to notarios or unscrupulous uh, attorneys that are in our community and falling victim to um, immigration fraud, paying tens of thousands of dollars for a benefit that unfortunately didn't exist. Um, so what I promise to the individuals that call our hotline is it may not be good news, right? I can't promise you that you're going to receive, a, you know, that you're qualified to apply for a, an immigration benefit. But what I can call, uh, promise you is that you're going to get quality information that you can make a decision um, for what's right for you and your family. And then the unfortunate circumstance that there is no immigration benefit that you or your family member is eligible for, then we can have those supportive conversations about what's next. And unfortunately, that is planning for the unfortunate event that you might be picked up um, by immigration. And so what does that look like? I can tell you that the conversations that we have with our clients are preparing for you know, the mom to, to say, who's going to pick up your daughter from ballet if you're not going to be there? Who's going to take your son to school if you're not going to be there? They're tough conversations, but I think as Dulce mentioned, they're, they're, nece they're necessary to have in this, client, or this climate and being able to prepare and just advance um, uh, those conversations, I think, is, is really lessening a, a little bit the trauma that um, could be impacted in, in those scenarios. Um, so kind of moving forward to the, the shelter, um, in October of this past year, October 26th, um, myself along with sev several other immigration advocates were at a meeting with ICE. These meetings happen, uh, or actually with CBP, um, happen probably every other month. Uh, this meeting was particularly interesting because I showed up in the room and we were like, this is interesting. We don't really get both of them at the same time. Um, I wonder what's going to happen. And so in the meeting, it was divulged to us that the government was going to be ending its quote unquote safe release program. The safe release program in short was an opportunity for families that were presenting at the port of entry um, to receive a phone call or to make a phone call to their point of contact or sponsor that was around the United States. And the family could call that point of contact or sponsor and have them make travel arrangements. And the government wouldn't release the family until the travel arrangements were made. So um, basically the families were spending a couple of days in custody, you know, uh, could be a couple of weeks, um, and they were allowing um, this kind of facilitation of communication for them to uh, advance the travel arrangements. Within 24 hours, we didn't know when the, when the policy was going to be implement or going to be taken um, into effect, but they just said that it was going to happen. And so we asked why and when, and we didn't really get answers. Within 24 hours, um, it was our 24-hour hotline that was activated by a community bystander that had reported. Um, 40 plus migrants had been dropped off at the bus station downtown in San Diego. And it was from that call and immediately on the night of the 26th that we had responded and basically um, began running a migrant shelter. Um, all of this to say that if the infrastructure of the Rapid Response Network had not existed, if we had not had that planning period and the near 10 months of organizing and, and building and you know getting all these supportive groups together to leverage our expertise, our resources, and our commitment to showing up for our community members, then I don't think that we would be at a place where we are now. Um, so that was a really te a, a testament to, to show that the planning 
um, and the ability of you know what we could do together as a community. Um, this is a picture of one of the families that fell between the cracks. So basically, every night, um, every day, myself and another staff member from ACLU, es Esmeralda Flores, are in contact with ICE, um, CBP, and Border Patrol. So we receive calls, texts um, at all times of the day and night, letting us know um, how many people are going to be coming to our shelter. This is a place of great fortune because for the first two months, we did not have that coordination and communication with ICE. We were literally driving around the county in search of any person that we thought would have been dropped off by, by the government at, at a bus station or a transit center at the airport um, that was essentially homeless. So I say that to inform you that it is kind of a partnership that we have to work with ICE, with CBP, with Border Patrol, so that we can advance um, our clients' lives, right, and be in a, p a position to prepare for them to arrive at our shelter. Um, and it's certainly an interesting dynamic. So this family um, was dropped off on accident downtown and spent the night on the streets. Um, she has three children, one of which is not um, pictured here and fortunately the next day we were able to have them come to our shelter and transported them. Um, we provided them immediately with um, food and, and a shower and a hug and one of the children said I was horrified. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was scared. I was cold. I only had my t-shirt. Um, I didn't know what was going to happen. So this for me is a reminder of the now 14,500 um, individuals, all family units that we have assisted since October 26th, and what would have happened um, should we have not come together as a community to stand up this um, migrant shelter. Thank you. So um, this this is, these are our old numbers because they're changing every day. Um, but so it's 14,500 individuals um, that we've served, all family units, um, acknowledging that it is, it's, it's unfortunate that we can't serve uh, other populations, right? So family units um, are specifically the only population, pregnant females and family units are specifically the population that we're able to serve at our shelter, but acknowledging that on a nightly basis, there are many other pop immigrant populations that are in need of shelter. So we're hoping that long term that this is going to be a way for me to, um, or for us to, excuse me, uh, advocate for long term migrant shelter and protection in the US. The average stay is between 12 and 48 hours. So we're really a respite shelter. I joke um, that we are professional travel agents and that it is our job to really make sure that somebody is travel ready so that we can facilitate their uh, reunification with their family. 99% or more are um, not here long term and then we receive between 60 and 75 individuals each day. It really fluctuates um, about two and a half weeks ago. It was around 100 each night. Um, the most that we've received in one night, I think, was 268. And so we don't find out the numbers, again, b between like two, three hours before they arrive. Most have mild uh, health issues, so scabies, lice, upper respiratory infections, um, the flu, chicken pox on occasion. Um, and I've personally, like, physically held a baby that was two days old, and the mom was still recovering from um, giving birth. So we've hired 40 plus staff to sustain this operation, um, hundreds of volunteers, more than a million dollars in fundraising, um, and then of course in-kind donations. Acknowledging that we're in the state of California, which has provided tremendous amount of support. Um, I'm constantly in communication with a lot of the other respite shelters that are along the southern border, and it's very clear to me that we are very fortunate to be in a place that we have resources and that we're able to assist with the medical and the health and the travel, all of it. Um, a lot of the other shelters don't have that opportunity. 
Um, so successes and challenges, the successes are clear that we've come together, that we are um, making a difference at our county, uh, the political aspect as well with the County Board of Supervisors, acknowledging that the County Board of Supervisors are where, uh, allowed us to be where we are at a, at a county-owned facility that we are now leasing for, through the end of this year. Um, that would not have been uh, possible without a lot of the organizing and, and advocacy that was done. Deepening partnership across all a, um, aspects of the project, increased awareness. I think this is for me as an immigration advocate, an opportunity to educate our community about what's happening. You know, the largest land border crossing in the world is in our county. Um, and so every day there are hundreds, and I'm sure Nicole will talk more, um, uh, asylum seekers that are seeking refuge in this country. Um, and then acknowledging that there are a lot of challenges, the federal policy shifts, um, the migrant protection protocol, which I mentioned at the outset. Um, JFS was one of the only organizations that, that is providing uh, representation to the families that have, in individuals and families that have been impacted by the MPP. Um, and it's incredibly difficult as a supervisor of a legal team to see your staff go on the south side of the border and literally have people pulling at you desperate for help and then knowing that we are one, two, three, a staff of 15 total that don't have the capacity to serve everyone. Um, so it, it's, it's horrible, um, but I am very proud to be a part of an organization that has taken a stand um, and that is dedicating significant resources um, towards, you know, affecting change um, in a very tangible way. Um, so the top four takeaways for me are that social challenges are complex and they require innovation. Um, again, we can't approach something with the kind of same mentality um, as we have in the past. We really need to take advantage of collective thinking and how we can best serve our community. Relationships and partnerships um, are critical within and across all sectors. That I think is the, the, the linchpin of how the Rapid Response Network has been so successful is that there are, it's a multidisciplinary approach that there um, are multiple organizations across different sectors. Um, and then an organizational appetite to take strategic risks. That has made us nimble. So for the first two months of operating the migrant shelter alone, um, we were unfunded. For the first year and a half of operating the Rapid Response Network, we were unfunded. Um, so we, we didn't take this risk saying, well, what am I going to get out of it? We took this risk because we knew that our community needed assistance. Um, and then lastly, the direct service and advocacy is a critical approach. So leveraging the resources again. So ACLU is a critical partner. Um, JFS is providing the, the direct representation. ACLU is suing everyone in court and making systems <laughs> wide uh, impact. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.